everybody? How's it going? Good, sir. We got donuts in here? What's going on? <laughs> what, what, how did y'all get them? I bought them. Oh, you bought donuts for everybody? Stan, you need a donut? Please? No, not for me. I'm driving. No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Do I look like a policeman to you? <laughs> All right, hey, everybody. I'm going to let him get started, but I wanted to kind of describe what we got going on here. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel retired Stan Goldstein. Um, 27-year vet of our Air Force, uh, 56 to 83 uh, was when he was in, in our service, and he's still going strong today. Uh, he volunteered his time to come up and talk to us about what he did for the Air Force. He did a lot. I don't want it to be overshadowed by just his presentation here, but uh, one of the most important things he did was kind of make history as the few people that took on this wild weasel role. Uh, during uh, our Vietnam conflict. And uh, he's going to kind of describe some of his stories today. But what you have in front of you is some of the artifacts of his career uh, that he wanted to share with you, one of which Parker was already snatched up. Um, he brought in a flight suit to, to give away, and I, I think he's thinking that somebody may want to take some of these old boots if they want to. Um, but I, I'll give that over to him. Uh, without further ado, Stan, over to you. Thanks. Good morning, gentlemen. I'm here to give you a briefing. Let's find out who's going to do it. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure who's going to show up. I know you were thinking of this guy, Tom Cruise, but he's big <laughs> Why are we here today? You're here because the colonel said be here. <laughs> I'm here because I had nothing better to do and I get to play a favorite game, I get to talk and you guys get to listen. But if you finish before I do, please wait so we can finish at the same time. And no snoring please because it keeps me awake. <laughs> okay, what's a wild weasel? We're going to talk about that. Battle of the Beans, electronic warfare starts a little bit earlier. Is it better if we turn the lights down some yeah. more? Well, well, I don't know. I don't. I have I can no turn idea. Turn the front ones down, but then they won't be able to see how good looking you are. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they need their shades on. Do you want that? <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. All right, good. Anyway, you can see this better. And we'll talk about these subjects: the sand threats, how we counter them, the first sand school kill, and where weaseling is going today. Okay, what's a weasel? Specially trained crews, fighters with special sensors, weapons, and of course the tactics on how you're going to employ them. And it's the mission to kill or suppress SAMs. And it wasn't accepted at the time. We were sort of a sec still a, uh, a second sister, but we want to contribute to air superiority. If you can't control the air, you can't do your job. And in the old days, the fighter pilot said, the only thing we care about is air to air and shooting down MIGs, but if you, SAMs don't let you do your job, you ain't gonna do it. The program was called, used to be called defense suppression, but the uh, Brits and the Germans didn't uh, like that name, so we've changed the name to SEED, suppression of enemy air defenses. I wanted to use suppression of hostile intercept terminals, but SHIT, it wasn't <laughs> Okay, World War II, we get the Battle of the Beams, they have the first radars coming up, the Germans have radars, the uh, Brits uh, uh, take little pieces of foil and cut to the frequency and throw it out the airplane, they called it window and shaft. We had our first uh, ferret aircraft, our early B-17s with receivers trying to suck up the early radar signals. Um, we have a first SAM by the Germans. <coughs> Korea, not much happens. The only thing the uh, North Koreans had was some radars to control the guns uh, uh, for the B-29s that came at night. Here is one of the first SAM surface-to-air missiles. Uh, the Germans took a, uh, a V-2, cut it in size, and then they're going to put a cockpit in it, and this guy is going to be flying up, and at the last minute, he gets to yomp out. Well, luckily for the pilot, the program went away and he didn't have to do it. You'll find out sometimes I revert to a German accent. Now, how many of you people have heard or have seen Dr. Strangelove? Man. <laughs> <laughs> Mandatory assignment. Right? 
Dr. Strangelove, or How I Love to Live with the Bomb, it was a Peter Sellers movie back around 62 or 63. It is one of the top 100 movies made all times. It's supposedly one of the greatest comedies of all times. And if nothing else, look up Dr. Strangelove on Wikipedia. There'll be other test questions as we go along. It's open <laughs> book, but I hope you'll get with it. Okay. The very first Sam that we know uh, uh, shoot down is uh, 60 Francis Gary Powers and a shot down over, over Russia. However, in 62, we have the Cuban Missile Crisis. And you've got a U-2. Major Rudolph Anderson was on his sixth mission and a Cuban SA-2 shoots him down. What's, um, I get to go to Havana, Cuba a couple of years later, uh, ago, not later, and actually saw one of their SAM batteries there. And I didn't realize that at the time, but in front of it was some air care parts and it was there, that U-2 <coughs> uh, that had been shot down. One quick uh, thing, let me go back for a second. <coughs> this is 62, Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, we also, before that you had had uh, LBJ, um, um, had uh, done the Bay of uh, uh, Fidel Castro going ashore, Bay of Pigs, and screwed up there. Uh, does anybody know what yesterday, I think maybe the 58th anniversary of what took place yesterday? The Kennedy assassination, sir? Right, you would like to go for the $64 question. No, but um, <laughs> seriously, that, that is true. And have you heard of the butterfly effect? Something happens and it affects. To me, that was a, a butterfly effect for me because Kennedy, had he not died, probably would have withdrawn or, or tabled down what was going on in Vietnam. However, LBJ takes over and that's another game. But anyway, so that's how my life gets impacted by that. And at that time, by the way, I was sitting at the University of Missouri Air Force has sent me there for, uh, through AFID to get my master's degree in industrial engineering. Hey, and one time I was an ROTC cadet like you guys back in 1956. Dark ages, I understand, last century, but. Okay, Vietnam, the, the story we're gonna to tell today. Um, it was uh, overruled and run by the Japanese for many, many years. The war ends and there's a guy, Ho Chi Minh, who's wounded during the war, the CIA takes care of him, picks him up, he's very pro-American. However, well, the State Department doesn't do well, and we get him mad at us again, he goes to Russia, and now what his goal is to take over all of Vietnam and unite it into one country. So he knows what he wants to do. Well, you got the JCS, they know what they want to do, they want to win the war and keep him from coming down south. LBJ, he wants to send a message. He's a politician. He really doesn't want to do anything. All he's interested is in getting elected and getting his social program too. The, the war is a side issue to him. The threat evolves. North Vietnam, they're ready to fight Korea. They're expecting B-29s coming in at 35,000 feet. Bah, they got a couple of big guns. TAC Air comes in, F-100s, uh, 104s, deuces, uh, and they're coming in and say, we need more weapons and such. Pick up the phone, call uh, China, call Russia, and all of a sudden we have now 5,000 guns, we have 26 SAM sites, we have numerous AAA batteries, and it becomes the most defended spot on Earth. And so the SA-2 mix come, and that's really uh, where, where we start from. So the Sams are coming, and there was a movie, the, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, so the play on. The Sams are coming. CIA U-2 flies over and says, they're building Sam sites. Duh. JCS say, kill them now. <laughs> uh, JCS calls for the site destruction. Then we have EB-66s, and I'll show you a picture of Recky Bird that I have seven or 800 hours in, uh, and it picks up Sam signals. and. It says, JCS says, call for site destruction. 
LBJ and his buddy McNamara, Robert Strange McNamara, you, may, you guys heard of him? Okay, well, at least we're in the same book there. And they didn't want to do anything up north because they might, uh, they might be Russian um, observers or actually people who were installing the uh, SAM sites and then bringing MIGs in. So he didn't want to perturb them, or cause them chagrin, pardon the word, didn't want to piss them off. If you, can. you can write me up early for bad language. But. <laughs> anyway, here are the B-66s. I've got uh, 800 hours in this. This is in the bomb bay, and there's four EWOs back there with little headsets and looking at, at, at scopes and very archaic equipment. Later on, they also then uh, take a one of the bomber versions Take and take out the Bombay, and you can see all the stub antennas. And their purpose was to jam all the radars in it. The B-66 would transmit the very first signal. Uh, bluebirds are ringing, and all of a sudden, we knew that the Sams were up in the air. McNamara, he doesn't want to really go to war. He thinks he's dealing with U.S. politicians, and he wants to send a message. And he does rolling thunder. And he says, "Well." We'll go ahead and we'll bomb just these little places and maybe they'll talk. They're not talking. We'll, we'll bomb a little harder. And this goes on. And he and McNamara, they plan the war, okay? They start picking targets. They start picking ordnance. They start picking when to do it. Well, it's micromanagement, target selection, and all this stuff, rules of engagement. Uh, oh, you can't hit the SAM sites and you can't hit the mix. And a prohibited no fly zone. And in red, you should, maybe shouldn't do on a slide, was guaranteed failure. Here's a book you really should read. It's 600 pages long. I quit at 500 because I got the big picture. Do you know what the word <laughs> mendac? Do you know what the word mendacity means? Guys, we're going to have to send you back to school. What? Sorry, sir. Wrong. Oh. Nice try. <laughs> mendacity is lying. And these people were lying. They were sending messages up and wouldn't believe it. These two guys wouldn't believe the military, the JCS. And maybe rightly so, because the JCS was too busy fighting among themselves, fighting for turf. Give me more money. Let me put more airplanes in. I want only helicopters. So they were fighting among themselves. LeMay at the time said, hey, bomb them back to the Stone Age which in fact really was the answer at 12 days of, of uh, Hanoi that you, you didn't get their attention until you would finally do that. But anyway, if you read through this book, uh, H.R. McMaster, he was the advisor, uh, military advisor to Trump before he quit, but he, did, he wrote this uh, as a, uh, his thesis uh, while getting his degree at the Army War College. It is really a super book and uh, reading about how the government operates and how these two guys wouldn't listen. Anyway, another brilliant thing, we now divide Vietnam, see, this is a point, okay, and we divide it into route packages. Air Force here, Navy here. Navy get these little circles are the SAM coverages all the way through, and of course you had, the Navy had it 6B, and Air Force had Pac-5 and Pac-6, over here, and here's Thud Ridge, which becomes quite uh, important because we would go over Thud Ridge and come down. Uh, when, you, when you're below a mountain, the radar can't see you, so it's a good way to, to get in there. So we have all this stupidity. You had to have permission from the Navy to go drop in, in their area of expertise. Not the most brilliant way to fight a war. Okay, classic Sam SA-2 site, the Star of David. You've got, oops, let me go back. You got your control bands here, and you've got all your little SAM sites clustered around it. That's the way it looked in Europe. It really didn't look that way in uh, Vietnam because they would camouflage them and put them near hospitals and schools. More to be said on that. I cheat in my briefings because here's the best picture I could get of an SA-2, and this is actually in Egypt. Uh, it seems in 73, the Israelis, there was the Yom Kippur War, and I happened to uh, have been over there uh, on a J JCS and a DIA team collecting some of this stuff and working with uh, some of the Israelis. Here's a picture, and someone would say, why do you have these crummy, grainy pictures? You've got to realize you had little guys crawling underneath barbed wire, 
holding a little Minox camera to take a picture. So the pictures, you get the, you get the idea of what was happening. The interesting thing here is you've got this booster here that sends it up, to get it up to speed to 2.5. After the first six seconds, it falls off. Where does it fall off? Right near where you shut it off. And if you put it by your schoolhouse, it's going to fall on the schoolhouse. Uh, newspaper says, Americans now bomb schoolhouse. So that's where you get that sort of stuff. Uh, if you want to see a pretty one, you can go to the Wright Path Museum and you can see a nice, shiny, all cleaned up one. Also, if you go there and there's a wild weasel corner and you can see me and my story and blah, 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 uh, and my party suit, but that's another story. <laughs> Okay, July 24th, first one gets shot down. Um, sad story. Uh, the guy in the back seat was just checking out the guy in the front seat. His bag was packed and he was going to go home And on the next flight. He doesn't make it. The guy in front, he be becomes a POW. This guy, really bad luck. Bad news, Charlie. He had been shot down in World War II and had been a German prisoner, so he had a lot of prison time. Here's what an SA-2 looks like in flight, and we call it a flying telephone pole, flying 2.5 miles. Okay, here's one, a missile coming up at a, at a thud. And the name of the game is, if you can see the missile, you've got a chance to beat it. So you don't want to fly right over an overcast where it's going to come right up, and you don't want to fly in the clouds. But what you do is you get this missile, and you get it, and you decide to either put it at 10 o'clock, that's your 2 o'clock, or the 2 o'clock, you know. Anyway, you get it here, and you turn the airplane to it, and you turn into it. And all of a sudden, he comes at you, and then when your underpants tell you you can't do it anymore, <laughs> you now roll over and go down. <laughs> it rolls down and comes down with you. Once again, you check your shorts, for, you know, for guidance, and you now pull up. Now what happens is it has short wings and if you're an aeronautical engineer you realize it doesn't have the surface area, it can't make it and it goes into the ground. So you've won that and you can get back to the bar on that particular one. Unless of course you've run out of airspeed and thoughts and they've sent a second missile at you and that's a bad day. Okay, they shoot down the RF-4C. What are we going to do? The 7th Air Force says, okay, let's go in and kill those SAM sites. McNamara says, oh, wait a minute, we have to think about this. we got to plan this. So what McNamara does, he waits three days, then sort of announces to the world, we're going to get those guys up there. What are we going to do? Well, McNamara is a number by the books. Like, what do you call it now when they do baseball and then you have all these great numbers? If you, and by the numbers, you, every weapon is in a book and you can tell how to deliver it at what speed to get you a certain degree of kill, 99%. If, in fact, you take a napalm and can drive it at 350 miles an hour at 50 feet, yeah, you can get 99%. The only thing is the guy who did that didn't put it in a box where people are shooting at you. So they're telling these guys they got to do it at 350, they're fighting, they, they launch 48 aircraft, six of, two aboard, so it's 46 from two different squadrons that, at a Karat and Top Lee, and send them up to hit two targets. And the brilliant, this is all from McNamara and friends, and they're coming like this, and they got to turn and miss each other turning off. Not brilliant. They lose six uh, thuds that day. Excuse me. Drinking on the job. <laughs> if he had provided beer, it might have been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When you have a problem in industry or in the military, what's the thing you do? We form a committee. Let us study the problem. Luckily, in this case, they got this guy, Dempster, really had his Sierra together. And he said, okay, his committee comes up. What have we got to do? A, you've got to locate this thing. Where is this guy? And how are you going to do it? We'll use a two-hole or a two-seater uh, fighter aircraft because a single one is too busy for a guy to try and do this all by himself in a single seat. And we will call it Project Wild Weasel. Actually, they wanted to call it Project Mongoose, but then they checked and found out the Navy had used that term before, so I'm a wild goose, I'm a wild weasel instead of a mongoose. I'm much prettier that way. And the other thing is they, they said they would have to call it Project Wild Weasel, and then you also had to jam the threat. 
So you can take the radars, make them blind that he can't shoot at you, supposedly, okay? <clears throat> Committee size up. In the basement, you've got Pierre Levy, a, a SAC officer, and you've got Dr. John Grigsby, and he's given the thing. How are you gonna find it? He knew that this guy had been making black boxes for the U-2 so they could see where the SAMs were. And so he calls him in and says, we need some boxes, we need three of them. Um, and uh, Grigsby says, how much money you got? I got eight, uh, he says, I got $80,000. He says, that won't even buy you one. He says, hey, sign up with me and it's, it's gonna be good for you, good business. Anyway, it's in the days of the old days so they signed a contract on a blackboard. Does anybody know what a Polaroid camera is? <laughs> okay. This contract was signed by taking a picture of this blackboard, and that's how that program got started. What do they do? They come up with a two-holer F1, uh, uh, F-105F. Problem was, it's a lot slower than the guys it's trying to protect. More about that to come. So we come up with the wild weasel patch. YGBSM. How'd this happen? Here's the secret program. They take some of the top EWOs in SAC and then they say, uh, are you willing to sign up for a program we can't tell you about, but it could be dangerous? Guy says, yeah. So they go to a room in the Pentagon, knock on the door, guy comes in and he says, you're gonna still do this? Hands him a ticket. They fly out to the West Coast to LA uh, at the uh, North American factory where there's an uh, F, uh, F-105F, the uh, Secretary of the Air Force is standing in the corner smoking his pipe, you know, listening, and they tell him what the mission is. And this guy, Jack Donovan, my friend, also impacted my life because I had to replace him in the Pentagon. But anyway, he says, let me get this straight. You want me to jump in the back of some fighter with some crazy fighter pilot, and you want us to be a target so that Sam's could sue with us? You gotta be shitting at me. And so that's where YGBSM came. If I offended anybody, then you're in the wrong Air Force. Anyway, these are the initial guys who, who flew the uh, first one at F 100. Uh, and it was a learn by doing. They go over there. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> they go over there and uh, to um, Karat. They lose five aircraft in, in the first couple of days. It's a learning proposition. How do we go up against these SAMs and get the job done? So what do they have on board? You have this scope, and basically it points, uh, the, the strobe points at the direction where the SAM is. The reason they, this is dashing, this is a test signal, and each of the, start of the dotted lines is one type of frequency, the dash line, here with the dot is another type, and the good old SA2 and S-band at that time, which was actually about two and a half gigahertz if you're counting, and that's it. And you could then turn the airplane in direction or know which way the missile is coming from. Your problem is when you got about 10 of these all up, and you know, and uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the Dr. Pepper look on there. Um, and so, anyway, they go ahead and the Wild Weasel mission is uh, set up. Iron Hand, strike support, first in, last out. Well, they were real, the F-100s were the last out because they were so slow, you know? <laughs> there goes everybody, you know, sitting around the corner. And then the Hunter Killer is when you went out, there wasn't an assigned mission, you didn't go off with the strike force, and you went out and just trolled for Sam's. Hey, look at me, shoot at me, come on up. You know, so you play that game. And that's where, I guess I told my suppression of hostile intercept stories a little too early, but. Here's where it is. That's the official name, C. Uh, F-100 uh, Sam, painted by Keith Ferris. Uh, and this is the uh, day of the kill, 1222. Uh, Jack Donovan, Alan Lamb, get it, having popped up. Lamb rolls in on it, he's so excited he almost overruns it there, but he gets some rocket paws in it. And you can, you can see these guys circling. Once he identifies the, the uh, target has dropped the ordinance from these pods, these guys come in and kill it with hard bombs. Okay, Wild Weasel 3. Wild Weasel 1 was the 100. Wild Weasel 2, they tried to do it in an F4C. Uh, the electronics didn't work. The, uh, 
uh, everything was rusty and crusty in there, so they come up with the 105F, and that's my aircraft that I flew. So the, this portion of the story is slightly biased as I tell you what I'm doing and uh, how we did it. Here was at school at Nellis, there's the two holer. Here's my class. Can you figure out which one the kid is? Well, for those with bad eyesight, here I am. <laughs> Uh, here's my pilot, the guy I crewed with, and my wife hates the, here, but this is my first marriage. When you go to war in a mission like the Weasels, the guy you fly with, you want to be compatible, okay? And I was very selective, you go through, and they, initially they were going to select people, and then they left it to the air crews to figure out how they were going to do it, and you go to the bar, and you drink, and you walk around and talk to these guys. Well, I wrote off some of these guys, like Harry Matthews here because Harry already had 13 or 14 missions already there on a previous TDY, which meant you go fly with him at about 87, he says sayonara, and he leaves you, and the guy, my buddy of 65 plus years, flies with him and then has to fly with the staff. And you fly with the colonels, mm. they're colonels, you know, they were good in their days, some of them, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we did lose, where is it, Gold James and Larry Martin were the only ones we lost in our class and on July 14th. Um, there's a book I have here that lists the every single fixed wing aircraft that is lost in Vietnam. The idea was not to have your name in this book and also the idea, our job was to make sure this book was as thin as possible. It's called Vietnam Hobson's Lost. Anyway, so that's the class. Well, we're going to have a graduation party. Every, everything has a graduation party. I consider myself, do you, have you, you know the movie Forrest Gump? Uh, okay. I'm sort of a graduate of the Forrest Gump. I'm always around when something has happened. Someone says we're going to have a party with the strippers on the party the next night, and we need somebody for publicity shots. Goldstein, you do it. You can see I'm... A, to go eyeball to eyeball, I'm a couple of steps up the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Republic is the only aircraft designer where they build the ladder first and then they build the airplane. But anyway, so we then go have our party. And here's Kitty the Cat Girl. Here's my buddy Dave Brog, still working with him. For those of you, he's now the executive di director of the Air Warrior Courage Foundation. And as some of you will find out, we give out educational grants uh, to each of the ROTC detachments here. Sitting in the back with a drink in his hand is a guy, Chucky Horner, General Charles Horner, who get, a captain at the time gave me my first ride in the 105, goes on to become the air commander of Desert Storm. And he tells uh, the Army guy, whatever his name is, he says, I'll, let, I'll take over it if you let me run the war the way I want. And he remembers the stupidity of Southeast Asia where the Navy had theirs and the Air Force had theirs, and the Marines said, hey, we only fly in support of Marines. He says, if you give me control of all the service air things, I will run the war. And he does, and of course, does a fantastic job. Anyway, suddenly, the next morning, hung over slightly in at 3 o'clock in the morning, we sit in the class, and they say the following names will report uh, for uh, a briefing, you are going to Osan, Korea because the Navy lost a boat. They like to call them ships. I call them boats because it, you know, bugs them. Anyway, <laughs> they, they, lose, they lose this boat and they say, okay, all you guys, go listen to what's going to happen. Briefing is run is um, Billy Sparks, one of the great weasels of all time, and he's telling us what to do. There's my pilot, there's me, there's my buddy Dave Brog. He was the guy who said, hey, come in and uh, go to war. So anyway, we're supposed to sneak off in this very secret mission. We take off, we can't even tell them where we're going. We follow, follow file phony flight plans. That was a, a tongue twister. However, one of the crew chiefs tells his girlfriend, the girlfriend tells the local paper, so here's the secret mission the next morning on. <laughs> <laughs> You go to uh, arrive at uh, Karat uh, after having 42 glorious days at Osan, Korea, and they take the hero pictures for you to send home to mom and dad and the family. And 
than his, his old wattage, you know. And I don't really have bulging ankles, but what it really is, you go to the BX, you never had a border for any other, you buy baby bottles, and then you fill them with water because the first thing, if you have to bail out, you're rather thirsty. So these lumpy bumpies were extra can bottles of water in my pockets there. And that's the G-Suit that is sitting on that crusty table. Stand back, I hope it's not loaded. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is my office uh, back there, pr primitive to what would come along later. Uh, here was the scope that had the direction of which way you're going. Here was the scope, if you had the time, you could analyze the signal. When the shooting actor, there isn't enough time for some of the guys who came out of SAC, this, that was their shtick, and they would do it inbound, and they could say, that's a bar lock, and the operator's name is Irving, or whatever he said. Here was a radar we controlled for dropping bombs. That's another mission. And you had a couple of lights up here that would light up. It was called the azimuth sector light. And what that said, a ra SA-2 has got two beams. And if you're in the two beams, this would light up in the, in the azimuth sector. However, we called it the ah shit light. <laughs> <laughs> Here are the conventional bombs, okay? I have to put my German accent on it. Is this again, another stupid thing. LeMay says, we are a nuclear air force. We don't need no stinking conventional bombs. We sell them. So they sell them off, and Germany buys all the casings. In the middle of the war, we run out of bomb casings. What do we do? We have to buy them back from the Germans. Uh, however, remember McNamara is back there and he's a numbers man. And he grades everybody on numbers. Doesn't care how many bombs you drop, how many sorties did you fly. So instead of one airplane, one thud, carrying six bombs, you will send three aircraft up endangering all their lives with two bombs. But you're filling the square, good boy. <laughs> the other thing which you're not supposed to drop now against people is the cluster bomb unit. Inside it goes out and you set the altitude and it opens up and tennis balls there, they spin. Uh, well, it, you can also, good against troops, but you're not supposed to do it. They're very effective against the antennas because if you can put holes through the antennas, you've won at least the engagement for the day, blah, blah, blah. No matter what they say, the guys upstairs in the Navy really have their Sierra together. I've only flown in one Air Force airplane, it was the 105, my other uh, two were navies, the B-66 came from the A3D, and of course the Phantom starts out as, as a boat driver's uh, uh, bird. However, they had the very first missile, the Shrike AGM-45, it's got a seeker head in it, tuned to the frequency of the radar, and it goes off. The only thing is using this was like fighting, uh, having a knife and a, 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 I guess a sword and a telephone booth because you could only shoot at 17 miles, but the SAM could shoot you at 22 miles. Eh, you know, make life interesting. So, um, <laughs> if the missile went down, uh, if the radar goes down, the missile goes blind, and it becomes just a, a bullet into the ground. And so, they come up with the AGM standard arm. This came off a boat at carriers, and it stood up there, and they used this to go against shoot at aircraft, but they converted to shoot against radar sites. And they put a smart seeker in the front, and now, in fact, you can be looking away and shoot over your shoulder there and shoot a longer distance. And this becomes the big thing for what our accuracy during um, the rest of the sea campaign. Okay, here's the game. You got the weasels going in first, and uh, then comes the strike force, 24, 78, whatever you want, and then you got the mid cap, and then, uh, uh, which are the strike bombers, you've got some recce guys ready to take your picture and back here and are jamming support. These guys used to be in close, in close until they got shot down and they decided, hey, um, guys, you can still do your job if you're further back. So that's the, uh, of course, you got your search and rescue guys and the AB Triple C, Big Mother, uh, up in the sky telling you what to do or what's going on. Planning the mission. Actually, the reason I built this slide is I had this great model of the airplane and uh, I wanted to show it up here. <laughs> <laughs> what it really says, you're planning the mission and so you know where the SAM sites are. Well, 7th Air Force in their wonderful way says, you take pictures of the SAMs and you will take them to me in Saigon and then I will give them back to you. Anyway, we had to deal with the T-39 guys, T-39 guys, scatbacks, 
who would actually drop off the locations of sand so we knew where to plant them. Yeah. The only reason I throw this slide up there, uh, this is my aircraft, the one, um, even my email is Stud424, and it's one of the last pictures before it gets shot down at the end of the war. But uh, luckily not with me in it. But uh, uh, nothing, hero picture, so you sometimes had to sit alert if one of the other airplanes crashed, so someone said, hey, look at that, check the fuses, I want to make sure the bombs fall off in the right direction. Um, Taxiing out, a little help from the guard squad. Hey, take your blessings from wherever you can. No one's, no one's an atheist in a foxhole. But uh, we became real good buddies with the priests, and they were buds, and really a good bunch of guys. Here's a thug uh, D-model taking off to join the tankers. <clears throat> here's a, um, back this one. Here's, here's the F model, and flying on his wing is a D model. We didn't have enough of the thud weasels, so we would give this guy munitions a uh, shrike, and he would pull up with us and we'd fire in tandem. The other reason I like this slide is it points out and proves my point that I think the two hole of which I flew was a much further airplane than the single hole. But <clears throat> here's the gang, all 24, 48, whatever, going downtown. Hitting the tanker. And by the way, no one ever snuck into Vietnam. You get all these 135s up, just big aluminum clouds in the skies, and the early warning from the uh, North Vietnamese, they see that, and the guy says, ah, the tankers are up. Well, the guys will refuel, that takes 10 minutes, 20 more minutes to get here. Hey, Irving, time for another cup of tea. So, you know, <laughs> there's taking it in. The 105 was the first and only aircraft that ever had the capability to do <coughs> with the boomer, and also the shuttlecock that the old 100s and the other planes where they stick it in, which is a little bit difficult as if you come in too slow, you keep pushing it away and you have to just put it in at the right. <coughs> and here's what it looks like from the tanker. <coughs> okay, it's off to the pack. The interesting about this, this was taken by another 105. He had pressed his gun camera film and he flew over it. You can see this. Here's your little feeling pole. <coughs> and this is just another painting by a buddy of coming off the Thud Ridge. Remember, when you're below the ridge, they can't see you. Then you pop up so you can attack the sands. <coughs> uh, Defels, uh, Leo Thorson does a great job. Um, kills a couple of SAM sites, um, finds uh, this uh, 17 trying to shoot down one of his buddies in the hangars, uh, hanging in the, in the parachute, <coughs> and uh, uh, goes home, and they, they, they put him in for a Medal of Honor. However, before he can get it, oh, yeah, they should have actually, oh, that's another story. Here are the two guys who get Medal of Honor. Leo, uh, really great guy, spent a bunch of time up north uh, as a POW because on, his, on a second flight, on, uh, he is forced to go up and launch again, which they never wanted to do, but they were short of crews. He being the lead weasel went up, and what the uh, sneaky little um, North Vietnamese would do, they knew once again what time you were taking off, they knew which way you were going to get towards Hanoi. Uh, so they low in the weeds, they come by, pop up, take one shot, and pull off, and with an AFOL, he then becomes a POW for his things. Defelson <clears throat> does a uh, bunch of great things on one day, uh, taking out a SAM site. He's damaged, he then has a MIG on his tail, and he dives back down into the flat, knowing that the MIGs won't follow him because they're smarter than he is, and he, he escapes, and then he comes back as it goes out to the tank, it helps with a search and rescue, and he also gets a uh, Medal of Honor. The interesting thing, this happens on the 10th of March, and you can always find it in this magic book by date and such, is there's a guy named Pardo. How many of you have heard of Pardo's Push? There we go. One out of ain't bad. Uh, same day, Bob Pardo and his buddy Bud Amen finding two F4Cs, and they take a bunch of flak, Eamon is dripping fuel. I mean, he can't hold it, and he's losing altitude. Pardo's in there, 
and they're still over North Vietnam. And they figure if I can just get into Laos or someplace, they can eject safely. So what does um, um, Pardo do? He tells, first he tries pushing it with his own airplane, getting the nose up in between the engine and pushing. It's not working. He says, drop your, your tail hook. Drops the tail hook, puts the tail hook on the, the bow of his canopy, and then pushes him, falls back, pushes him, his, he gets a fire warning light on it, an engine flames out, and they keep pushing. Anyway, they, they, they're pushed to safety, and they come out. Well, let no good deed be unpunished. Uh, the um, temporary squadron commander of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the unit, who is Chappie James, also known as Black Man to Robin Olds as Robin, anyway, wants to court-martial these two guys. Olds is on leave, comes back and hears what's going on, charges off to Saigon, and then neg negotiates. They won't give him a medal, but they won't court martial him. Anyway, so that's known as Pardo's push, and it's been done on stories. And you see two F4s, one with a, a tail hook down, and the other guy pushing. Here's the 100 kilo mission. Uh, after you've uh, done everything else for the day, you go out there and go trolling, say, hey, look at me, shoot at me, and uh, it'll pop up. And your second wingman would get that, you know, you can play fun and games. Here's a dead fan song, and, and as I said before, I cheat in my briefings because I take the slides wherever I can get them. This actually is an SA-2 in uh, Egypt. I happen to have been the, uh, my follow-on assignment was an instructor EWO at George Air Force Base, uh, the top F-4 Needham School, and the Israelis had just bought a bunch of F-4s, and they send their 10 air crews to uh, George, and I've become the instructor, become friends with them, the guy who sends me this becomes chief of staff of the Air Force. But anyway, this is a dead uh, Egyptian SA-2. And how did they kill it with the um, uh, with the Shrike? Because inside they found part of the Shrike motorhead inside. OK, other things we did. Uh, we uh, Because the Navy was doing it, they had an A-6. And uh, Ryan says, we're as good as the Navy. We can do the same thing, and we'll use the Thoughts. Who had a radar? But the, the radar was designed to drop nuclear weapons. 600 feet is good. It's a good thing, you know, with a, with a nuke. Give me a break. In fact, the cursor on the scope, in fact, translated to 600 feet itself. Anyway, so that was the mission that we would drop bombs at night. You will notice the spelling over here. The Thai tailors did not have a spell check. <laughs> And this is a takeoff on the SAC thing. Uh, peace was our, is our profession. Um, the other thing we did was run uh, interference with the B-52s. The B-52s wouldn't go unless there was a weasel up there running interference between them. And it's amazing to stand off to the side and watch these guys drop 104 bombs. And in one case, it was Don Hoy, it was the ferry. And so the guy starts over the water. Well, he starts dropping his bomb, the 52nd bomb is right on target, but you've got 51 in the water and 51 following on, but they do get their bombs there. Okay, fire B drones there. Why do I have this story in there? We did have drones in the war, the BKM uh, 134, 147. It took photos, it dropped uh, uh, leaflets, it dropped chaff, and also did some electronic reconnaissance. This airplane, this uh, drone, Tomcat, was the high time drone. He had, he had flown some 70 or 80 missions and been retrieved every single time. Except on his very last mission, it said that he paid for the, this uh, uh, drone paid for the entire program because just as he's being shot down by this SA-2, he captures the frequency of the beacon and the transponder right there of the set of the thing, sends it back to a rivet joint, one of my old friends uh, there, uh, boat and a B-47 collector on the trout, and they, we now know the frequency of the beacon, and so we can uh, come up with jamming and other devices. So that really paid for itself. The name of the game was to get 100 missions. Uh, so on November 25th, 1968, I get mine. The significance to that really is the bombing hole comes on October 31st. And I will not run for re-election. There will be no more bombing up north. And at that time, I just landed. 
and with my 99th mission, go running down to the, the section where they count sorties. I said, hey, have you miscounted? You know, what about the time when I went in the pack, came out, hit the refutal one? Sorry, that doesn't count. So anyway, we now start flying on the wrong side of the Mekong, and uh, it looks like I'm stuck there for another five or six months. And um, General Celso comes by and says, hey, Goldstein, if you want, uh, I'll let you check out an RF-4C, and you can get your mission. I said, hey, that will leave my pilot behind. He'd kill me. I don't want to do that. And people say, you get, instead of 100 mission packs, get a patch that says 99 and put a screw through it, you know? <laughs> One of the things when you finish up, you have a party. So there's my pilot, good old John. There's a Wattash there. In between is a Thai Army Major, uh, Roxy. What was her job? She was the VD control officer for the girls downtown. She made sure they were all healthy so that some of the enlisted troops, you know, didn't get in too much trouble or bring anything home. It wasn't the virus to go home. Uh, um, at, at my 100th mission, when I flew it, Keith Ferris was there, a famous artist. He, uh, I said, if you ever paint a thud, paint mine. And this has got Rebecca, my name on it. Crown 7 was our signal. You can see a copy of this by the elevator over there uh, anytime you want. Anyway, Vietnam air losses. Uh, my buddy, who, who was a POW, says it was really, I think it was 486, but hey, what am I going to do? The whole name of the game was to make these numbers as small as possible, okay? Uh, Modern Sam's SA-6, uh, my story with this, I'm in Israel ca capturing all the stuff, sending it back to the States, and I got this tell that I'm gonna send back, and a plane comes in, 141, and he says, we gotta cut these rails off to fit it in 141. You ain't cutting any rails off my stinking uh, tell. I need a C-5. It's November 25th. Um, thereabouts, and I'm at a um, Thanksgiving dinner with the Alsi guy, the guy's in charge of airlift, and I get a phone call, the C-5's in. Go running out to the base, and I had left this in a uh, El Al hangar. They had 707s that were working on it. Go into the hangar, it's gone. I've just lost 60,000 pounds of classified to us information. Go outside, the Israelis knew what was going on. They threw a tarp over it, so the Russian overheads wouldn't see it, and uh, I finally got it on the way back to the States. Here we finally come to the new F4G Wild Weasel, which was a sharp aircraft. Here's all the armament you can see on it. You've um, got the 78, the Harms, Maverick, and uh, really did a good job. Um, here's the updated. Now, now we're into digital uh, world of all this. They really had a great accuracy on it. And the regular aircraft instruments up here, but and such. And here's a couple of them flying in route in Baghdad. Oh. Anyway, um, you have Wild Weasel, uh, Rhino drivers. Uh, then the tradition, you've got F-16s coming on. Oh, here's the F-16, and the original ones that flew in Desert Storm weren't as accurate as the um, uh, as the weasel, though Dan Hampton, who wrote, wrote this book, uh, he, he's a Bible pilot and he bad mouths all two holers and the weasels, you know, they didn't care for us. What really happened is they modify the aircraft, they take out the second seat, and they replace that, replace me by this, 110 pounds of aluminum and 10 circuit boards. You don't have to give it any retirement pay and it doesn't take up any space at the ball. <laughs> Uh, here's an F4G, a Desert Storm, and another patch. We are all love patches. There it is in the revetment. Here's your uh, six, your Viper. Here, here's your Diesel. Here's another great patch. Here are the storm, the threats that they fit, uh, saw. And in, in addition to the two, three, six, eight, what? Of course, your friends will sell. Your friends will sell anything to anybody. So you had Kotals and Mullins. The one they were really worried about that in Kuwait they may have captured an IHOR. And the American IHOR, our Hawk batteries, was much more capable than any of those. And then you had the usual suspects, early warning radars, HSs, and the gun dishes. Um, I throw this up not to, to gee whiz you, 
or what it is, you come back from, from a mission seven or eight hours in, your butt's tired, you're hungry, you want to use a bathroom, yeah, and you got to get ready for the next mission. And the intel officer and the weapon system officer wants to know all this information. Uh, you'll notice, though, the oh, big interesting thing, these are all, all the call signs of beers. Miller, Coors, <laughs> Logan Roy, you may not be familiar with that one, Lone Star, a good Texas beer, Strohs. Anyway, you would have to list your target, how, uh, how good, oh, and I asked what was F for you, and he said it was a question, it was either true or false, did you kill it, success, false, you know, and then they had the quality, how good was the sighting that you were looking at, and then I think it was, and I asked him for the southern region, he had, they had shot, uh, took 950 shots, and they had about 250 kills. And a lot of the times they were killing the same site over and over. Not killing it, but putting it out. At this El Takar Air Base, they had an SA-3, and it was in a Rebecca, and then the only thing sticking up was the antenna. So they go and take the antenna out, come back the next day, and he's up again, you know. But anyway, this is the same sort of information. Imagine taking the exam here in the practice says before you can leave the room, how was your chair, was the temperature good? <laughs> what kind of pencil did you use, you know? So it's the stuff that has to be done sometimes, but that's it. Anyway, we now have the F-35. It's getting to a point, even like the F-16, every aircraft can do almost every mission. There will be certain squadrons that will take this on as an, eth an emphasis. But in the, uh, the schoolhouse, which is it, well, they're teaching the wild weasel mission. The guys are already wearing wild weasel patches, and they're really happy to be doing it. They will modify the Bombay to either take an updated uh, arm or, uh, or uh, put a new one in. But the best weapon over there is a small diameter bomb. Put the targets in, you know that, and you put this garbage can behind the house, and it will go and take the garbage can out behind the house. So it doesn't make a difference about whether you know the radar signature if, in fact, you have the physical location given to you to do your job as a weasel or as a fighter in building such. Uh, here's the evolution of, of all the airplanes. We gave the mission over in, to the 20th Tank Fighter Wing and made them the home. That's all of us here that day. Uh, Wild Weasel Society, membership, if you're involved with it, have done something in, in advocation of the, uh, of the weasel, we make it. Red River Valley Fighter Pilots originally started out as guys who went north into Pac-6 and were all by, by the Red River. Well, they finally decided it would be like the Chowder and Marshing Society and the B-25s, Doolittle's Raiders. If, in fact, you're a rated crew member, whether you're an engineer, a gunner, a crew chief, a para-jumper, you're eligible to be a river rat. One of my newest river rat friends over there is sitting in your fearless colonel, and someone will take a picture of us so I can send it off to the magazine and say, we're having a mini tactics conference today. <laughs> uh, a book I got involved in, everybody wrote their story up and uh, published it. Uh, and mine was called 99 Missions, How I Got My 100th. Uh, the next one is Hunter Killers, written by Dan Hampton. And th this is it. Um, Hampton had to get information, and once again, I'm the Forrest Gump guy, so he knew I could get the information, so he calls me, and I help him write the book, and I sent off a bunch of pictures to the editor, and this is me and my pilot on January 28th at 4 o'clock in the afternoon because they had sent all the married guys home to pack before going to Osan, and we were the bachelors, and that's me on the backside. Look good? <laughs> Uh, at the Air Force Museum, we established a, uh, a monument, uh, a bench to sit on. And they're very limited in what you can do. Here's Alan Lamb, the guys who got the first stroke. Alan's a little bent from jumping out of airplanes. Um, uh, Jack had a, uh, uh, a stroke and can't talk, but he was all there with it. Donovan had me replace him in the Pentagon in the fighter shop, so once again, he, he impacted my life. Um, Billy Sparks. I mean, this is really normally the end of his life. Being a wild weasel of Tuckley was, in my opinion, the single most important thing I've ever done. The mission was demanding, dangerous, and for those of us who there performed at a level I've never seen before, he's our one of my heroes.
This is the final slide. Hooray, hooray, applause. These are two cadets at the Air Force Academy in the 35th Squadron. And the 35th Squadron uh, wing is a weasel squadron and has been flying CJs. And these two took it upon them to have their activity room to honor the, um, um, the weasels. And I've been working with them to get it established. This will be dedicated on December 1st of this year. And I think that's it. The rest of the slides will be yes. Uh, <laughs> any questions? So you mentioned uh, that uh, slide that you had with the strike package where the weasels would be in first. Like, you all did not have any uh, support or cover for, I mean, you, wouldn't your mission then be like to get away from like enemy aircraft and avoid SAMs or? You're going and looking for the SAMs. You're gonna be between them and the SAMs and you want the SAMs to come up and focus on you. If they're focused on you, they can't focus on the guys who are dropping the bombs. Hopefully, you can duel with them and come back to the bar. You know, you guys all live in a digital world. My only digital thing there was ones and zeros. I either flew and came back or I didn't. You know, it was one or two, you know, one or zero. Uh, uh, but yeah, the, you let the, you're, you're interfering with their operation of them targeting the guys with the bombs and you're trying to make them shut down. Uh, sir, what was the um, ops tempo like being a weasel in Vietnam? Like, were you flying like missions almost every day or? If we could, we would have flown missions every day because the game was to get 100 missions. Well, the problem was you could do that in about three or four months. That screws up the training, the flow system. You're the guys in school, you can't do it. So the guys on the board, and you get about 14 or 15 missions a month, and so you were restricted. And uh, so the, the ops temple wasn't, you know, like that unless something special came up. And you would never fly a second mission uh, normally on a day. And that's why they wouldn't, when I came in with 99 missions, they wouldn't send us off uh, that afternoon. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to ask you real quick. So, can you tell them the story of how you were asked to become a wild weasel? Oh, it's Friday afternoon in the Air Force. Friday afternoons are always bad. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always four o'clock. Hey, it's personnel. Goldstein, come on down. And I go tootling down to personnel, and they said, you're going to go fly 105s and become a wild weasel. Uh... And I just before, I don't know if you've ever seen a, a flick. If not, please go to YouTube and look at There Is A Way, okay? And uh, they made this film because all the thug drivers were saying, there ain't no way we're going to get home. There was like a 50 or 60% chance of making 100 missions. World War II, you had the B-17s, 25 missions, you know, Memphis Belt, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I said, that's great. And I think to myself, boy, am I brave enough to do this? You know, I'm going to go to war. Anyway, I said, how do I get this assignment? He said, well, there was this major instructor at Maitland, that's where the old math school used to be, and uh, he decided his heart attack was happening again, so he decided <laughs> not to take it. This guy had been a flight leader of mine a bunch of years before in B-66s, so he turns it down, and then I luck out and, and get there, and he changed my life miserably, and the reason I'm standing here in front of you uh, and to me, it's one of the greatest things that ever happened to me and the greatest honors I have. And uh, those, for those two uh, girls I showed you were cadets from the Air Force Academy. They both just got their assignments. It's pilot training. They both want to be CJ drivers, uh, unless there's something better by the time uh, they <laughs> graduate. <laughs> hey, so, so, so some of these guys are going to be commissioning uh, next May. Do you think that there's like a timeless lesson from when you came on active duty as a, a cadet that you could pass to them? Uh, it's hard. I didn't come on. I came through ROTC, <laughs> Royal Ontario Tank Corps, I think it stood for. But uh, no, I, I'll tell you one thing. When you get into service, it may not be small. Really keep copious notes and document what you're doing. You may sometime want to write your 
the story up, tell your kids, your family, what did you do in the war, Daddy? Uh, one of the things, if I had to do over, I would have had, nowadays they take care of, write down every tail number I had. And I started writing the details of the first 15 missions, and I, I sort of let it go and, and such. So I, I regret some of that. I have to live off, off of memories. But that's one thing you can do for yourself. Um, and, you know, remember, whether you're in flying or not, everything really contributes to the, to the mission of getting the guys back to the bar in time. Well, I'm not sure what's happening in the Space Force now uh, uh, with that going on, with them shooting down the uh, uh, satellite and having the bits and pieces fall by the space station. But it's all important. I take my hat off to each and every one of you. I sat in that chair. It wasn't as nice a chair. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, one step above an old World War II, uh, one of those Quonset huts initially. Uh, and uh, uh, we'd, we had different uniforms, in fact, just blues we would wear at the time. But you guys are fortunate, you're the cream of the crop. I take my hat off to you, I say God bless, and uh, carry the flag forward. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody, appreciate it. Now, shall we get the beer? <laughs>